Well, the woman did this, she finally did it. She opened up the oil and anointed the head of Jesus Christ. We'll talk about that and more still to come. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV as we continue to read the Bible today. And one of the people that helps us do that is Corey. What's up? Today I'm going to be looking at some traditions that were associated and are associated with the gospel authors. Very good. Excellent, Corey. What'd you do, Jan? Sometimes we need to just stop talking. That's right. We need to stop talking. Okay, Ryan, what's going on? Today I'm dealing with an alleged inconsistency between all four gospel accounts, and that is why did the inscriptions on the cross of Jesus Christ not match up between any of these four accounts? That's a good question. We'll talk about that and more. Get your Bible out. Let's listen to what God has said to us. Mark 14, verses 1 through 9. After two days it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me, for you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish you may do them good, but me you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Mark chapter 14, verses 1 through 9. Matthew 13, or rather Mark 13 and 14, that's our reading assignment today as we continue going through the Bible. I think you'll find it interesting as we learn more about Jesus Christ. Now, remember that Mark was the first gospel produced. So as we read this, we have to learn that the, the, the people in the church were discovering who Jesus was and what he was doing. For better or worse, as Jesus came closer to his end and new beginning, people made their minds up about who he was. Now we should keep in mind that only God truly understood what he was doing about sin. He had a plan that the enemy did not know, and that was certainly a mystery even to Jesus' close followers. Jesus' appointment with death for the cost of our sin was an unsavory thought that we see that Jesus Christ spoke about with his 12 disciples before the fact. They don't seem to get in for this reason. They don't understand it. Perhaps they hoped it was another parable or teaching device. However, here in Mark, this is the record of the woman whom Jesus had healed. She brought very costly oil and gave this unusual gift to Jesus Christ. Her offering was harshly criticized, but Jesus came to her defense. She had come beforehand to anoint his body for burial. And then, as now, there is a plan. God has a plan. Now, this is fascinating. I find this interesting. Remember that people are making decisions about what Jesus is or who he is and what he's going to do. And this woman certainly made a plan. Get your Bible guide and turn to today's passage as we begin to study this. It gets interesting. Your Bible guide will take you to the passage right for it if you don't have one or go to Bible Discovery TV. That's a place where you can find a lot of things we have question and answer there. So uh, Matlock and myself have put together question and answers that you might have about God and about the Bible and all of that. It's at the Bible Discovery TV site. 
And uh, so if you make a donation, we would appreciate that. Thank you so much. And let me pray for you in this time. Father, I pray for the people who are struggling. Help them to understand that you will do miracles. You will do things that will be challenging to everybody else's mind, but to yours, it'll make sense. And to them, they will be have provision made for them as a result of that in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look at a memorial, this is interesting. Father, I pray that we would hear the words of your Holy Spirit. Let's take those words and apply them to our heart. In Jesus' name, and we all said together, amen. Now, watch this, okay? This is, pretend that you're not somebody who knows the end of the story, but just, just read this like you're reading it for the first time. This gets really interesting. Mark 14, verses one through three. It says, after two days... It was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Those are Jewish feasts. And the chief priest and the scribes sought how they might take him, that is Jesus, by trickery and put them, put him to death. But here's what they said. Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil and spikenard. Very costly. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. This is amazing. You see, the woman anointed the head of Jesus Christ with expensive oil. We are shown the importance of what Jesus did through his death and his resurrection. This is what the woman was doing. She was anointing our Lord and our Savior for burial, and she didn't know it, but for resurrection. Now, I want to tell you, this is amazing, because a lot of people didn't like it, because, you know, first of all, it's a woman. Secondly, she just comes in the house and does this. That's amazing. Now, what do you think the people did here? Well, let's go back to the scripture and and let's learn more about what happened. This is Mark 14, verses four and five. But you know, there were some who were indignant among themselves. And they said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? Pouring it on Jesus' head. It's wasted. Or it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii. A denarii is one day's work and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. Some criticized the offering she made. She made the offering, and some criticized it. When we give our lives to Jesus Christ, some will never understand why. They have closed their lives to Jesus Christ and closed their hearts to the Lord. They will never understand why. They'll think we're stupid, we're simple, and all that And that's fine. We've given our heart to Jesus Christ. And some just won't get it. But that's okay. Because when we get it, they know what we did. And when the time comes, they'll have an opportunity. That's interesting. All right. Now let's go on to the last part of this. By the way, a denarii is a day's work. That's interesting. Let's go on now. This is 14. And this is verses 6 through 9. Watch this. But Jesus said... Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? Why? She has done a good work for me. That's what Jesus said. For you have the poor with you always. And whatever you wish, you may do them good. But listen carefully. Me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for a burial. Jesus Christ said that. Now that must have thrown a lot of people into a loop because they didn't think he was going to be buried. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be also told as a memorial to her. 
<laughs> this, this is amazing. Listen carefully now. The offering was accepted and received by God Almighty. The offering was accepted. It was received by God Almighty. It is not important what men and women say about us. It is only important what God thinks. What does God think about you? What do you think he thinks? You know, tithes and offering are something that I give on a regular basis. And I want to tell you something. Uh, it's not Old Testament only. It's not. I don't believe that. There are certain things that make sense in the New Testament. Or one of them is the commandment, thou shalt not kill, the sixth commandment. Don't kill. Another one is thou shalt not commit adultery. That's, that's another one. That's the seventh commandment. You see, beloved, we need to understand that tithes and offerings are our gift to God. We give to God because we love him. And that's what she did. She gave that offering because she loved Jesus Christ. Now, as we pray today, think this through. Lord, thank you for loving me and paying the cost for my sin. Jesus paid the cost. He did. Beloved, we need to pay attention to this because the Lord is speaking now. Come to Jesus and say, Father, forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. A lot of people are talking about the end of time. He says that, they say that, and everybody on TV says something else. But what does Jesus Christ say? The Son of God, God and man, what does he say? That's so important. We need to come back to Matthew 24 and look at that because Jesus Christ does not lie. Well, it's time now to continue on with our Bible study. And as we approach the end of the Gospel of Mark, we're going to be reading about Jesus Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension. Now, there's been a question that's arisen in regards to all four gospel accounts, and some believe it's actually a contradiction. See, each gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, records a different inscription on the cross of Christ. So how can these four accounts be reconciled? Let's study. Critics of the Bible who are uncomfortable with its claims that it is the very Word of God have spent a great deal of energy attempting to find errors and contradictions within it. Especially under scrutiny have been the four Gospels or biographies of Jesus Christ. Many believe that these four accounts are in great conflict. For example, skeptics note that each of the four Gospels record a different inscription on the cross of Christ. Indeed, Matthew 27, 37 records, and they put up over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then in Mark 15, 26, it says, and the inscription of his accusation was written above, the King of the Jews. Luke 23, 38 says, and an inscription was also written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the King of the Jews. And John 19, 19 says, now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Clearly each gospel contains a slightly different quote of the inscription. So how can this not be considered an inconsistency between these four accounts? Take note that Luke records that the inscription was written in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is important because Matthew's audience was mainly Jewish, and so he likely quoted the Hebrew inscription. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Similarly, Luke's audience was Gentile, so he probably quoted the Greek inscription. This is the King of the Jews. And John gives detail to how Pilate also wrote a title and put it on the cross. And since Latin was the official language of the Romans, it follows that John was quoting Pilate's own Latin inscription, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Finally, Mark could have quoted any of these inscriptions, but simply abbreviated his version to the most relevant portion, the King of the Jews. It is clear to see that these minor differences of inscriptions between the gospel accounts can be attributed to which language each author chose.
You know, I really, really love the Bible because every time there appears to be an error or inconsistency, it forces us to focus in on the details, and in so doing, it usually reveals something hidden and awesome. In this case, we notice a detail that maybe we didn't really think about before. That is that the inscription was written in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. So it's conceivable that each gospel writer chose either the Hebrew, Greek, or Latin inscription based upon the reading audience or upon the context. The conclusion, there's no inconsistency. Corey, what did you study today? Thanks, Ryan. Well, today I'm going to be taking a look at all of the four Gospels, but I'm going to be looking at it not uh, based on their content or what's actually written, but based on traditions that were assigned to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John by the early church. So we're going to be looking at some interesting symbolism and some artistic representation as well. Take a look. That there are four New Testament Gospels instead of just one has puzzled more than one Bible student. A comparative reading of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John does display a type of answer, that there are clearly different theological emphases and materials uniquely covered by each author. Those in the early church, however, saw on top of the obvious reasons a divine purpose, a higher reasoning behind the four. The four Gospels are symbolically purposefully four. As the early church father Irenaeus pointed out in the second century AD, there are four zones of the earth in which we live, four covenants God made with all mankind, and four Gospels. His secondary biblical connecting point comes from the recorded visions of heaven from the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 4, John gets a glimpse into heaven and before the throne of God sees four living creatures, each with a different appearance, one like a lion, one a calf, one a man, and one a flying eagle. For many in the early church, these creatures symbolize the four gospels, perpetually praising God. It's no wonder, then, that in the later church, artists of all kinds grasped onto this imagery and the symbols for the gospel authors became the lion, calf, man, and eagle. The man, symbolizing Jesus' humanity, was attached to Matthew, who opens up his gospel with the genealogy of Christ. The calf was seen to represent Jesus' sacrificial role and was given to Luke as his gospel begins with the history of Zechariah the priest. The eagle was seen to portray the Holy Spirit and was given to Mark for his quick introduction of the Holy Spirit. The lion symbolized Jesus' leadership and royalty and was first attached to the gospel of John. In the 5th century AD, a shift occurred that switched Mark to the lion and John to the eagle, which can still be seen today in churches, paintings, and illuminated manuscripts. I always find it just interesting to be able to track down some of these traditions about the gospel writers. It, it kind of it illuminates for us some of the early church history and images that we see associated with them. Uh, and, and I think it's good also, you know, sometimes when we're reading through the New Testament and, and, you know, we're going through the Bible in a year, that's what we do here at Bible Discovery, we can get kind of lost in the weeds as we're going through. You know, we read Matthew and then really quickly Mark, really quickly Luke, really quickly John, and we see the areas of overlap between the, the Gospels, but it's kind of nice to be able to take a step back and realize that, you know, the, the earliest Christians uh, thought a lot about the Gospels too, and they thought a lot about how they were similar and what made them different and why they existed, why there were four. Uh, and, and everyone has always believed in Christianity that it is a very purposeful uh, move of God to have four. So it's, I always find it interesting and instructive to my own mind to be able to take that step back and look at the four gospels. Now, Corey, when you talk about this, and this is interesting because we need to, we need to think this through. When the gospels were taking place or when Jesus Christ refers to the scripture, he's not referring to the, the gospels because right. the gospels were not written yet, Right. but yeah. he's referring to the old Testament, the old Testament, yeah. what, what we would call as Christians, the, old, the, the, old the Jewish yeah. Bible. Yeah. He's yeah. referring to that. The law, the prophets. Yes. The yeah, and the writings and the wisdom and all that stuff. And 
And it's important. That's one of the reasons, by the way, why we go through the Old Testament. We spend a lot of year doing that because yeah. that's the Bible. That's part of the Bible. It's the entire context for the New Testament. It's what exactly. Je- it's what Jesus teaches from. So you can gain a cursory understanding of, of what Jesus is all about by just, you know, jumping into the New Testament. That is a legitimate place to start as a Christian. But then you have to move beyond it and you really do have to get that context and read through the Old Testament and kind of do your homework that way. Now, I mean, it's it's very interesting because as we read the Bible, you know, that's over 733,000 words. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's a lot of, there's a lot of words, you know. That's why Christians call it devotion because you have to be (laughs) devoted devoted to do it. (laughs) And so we want to encourage people to read their Bible and to, uh, to take it on. And that becomes very important, you know, when you, when you begin to understand what God's doing, what happens is, and I've read the Bible over 30 times, and what happens is you go through it, and I'm going through it again this year, and I'm like, man, I didn't even see that. Mm -hmm. The first 29 times, I never saw that. But the 30th time I saw it, actually more than 30 times, but the the times that you, it, it never gets old, and it's always new, and so we need to study the whole Bible. That becomes very important. And uh, I think that, that Jesus Christ, when we, when we look at the Gospels, the first Gospel showed up, it was Mark, and it showed up around AD 62 to AD 68, okay? Some people argue over when that is, and then there's other Gospels that come in. But we need to remember that the New Testament only covers a short period of time, mm-hmm. while the Old Testament covers a great, vast, expanse of time. Mm-hmm. And we need to remember that. Really important. History books are interesting, but the Bible is the Word of God. And that's something we need to be. The Bible is, is very much history interpreted. That's that's what you, if I had to that's kind of exactly group. exactly right. It, Every, put one broad stroke, which there's going to be a lot of people who have studied, you know, um, the, the types of, of literature that the Bible is that are going to be going, Ugh! but the history is, ge- the, the Bible is generally uh, here's the history and here's what it means. And what's so exciting too is it looks into the future as well. It does. It's, so there's stuff that hasn't happened yet. And so that's what I'm looking forward to as well. Kind and of seeing how, how it all plays out. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> that's how God speaks. He <laughs> speaks to all of time, not just to one, spe- one you know, essence of time, but all of it. Very, very That's good. why it's called the living word. It, it is, and it is living. And that's why you can read it over, and there there will be people that are watching that have read it even more times. They have. And, and they will say the same thing that you do, that we do, that we begin to make those connections, and it's super exciting. Well, the anointing at Bethany is one of those stories that you can read very quickly and miss a lot, or you can slow down and sort of view it uh, from the outside looking in. And there are at least four here different sections of that because each of the Gospels is written from a different point of view. Same same stories, but from a different uh, point of view from each person who's writing it. And um, we believe that this woman that's being described here in Mark is Mary Magdalene from the Gospel of John in chapter 11 and jo- uh, in John chapter 12, who mentions her, and she's also from Bethany. Now, Mary Magdalene was someone who uh, the scriptures tell us that Jesus cast seven demons out of her. So he dramatically changed her life. And from that point, she was devoted. She was always found to be at his feet. She was one of the women that would come to attend to the, the needs of the disciples, cooking and cleaning and the different, the different things that were required there. And so we, we see that she enters into the house and she breaks a flask and she pours it, this oil on his head. And it says here, but there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? I decided to call this section of mine today, stop talking. Sometimes we just need to stop talking. And it's that example again, that sometimes we can be so critical of others, even what they do for the Lord or how their actions are. And I'm not talking about that they're not following the Lord Jesus, that they're completely and willfully uh, doing something else. I'm talking about, once again, a heart issue. This woman was 
anointing the head of Jesus, which we later on see that even Jesus says, uh, she has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial, which she wouldn't even have realized that, that was she, that's what ultimately she was doing. She was coming to do something that was so precious, that meant so much to her. She won, it didn't matter about the value of it. What, what her value was, was in her Lord Jesus that had delivered her from a life of being possessed, of not even being able to, to have a life. He gave her a life on earth and she knew it was going to be eternal. So we need to stop. We need to stop being critical because we don't know the facts. And you know what? Sometimes the facts are none of our business. That's between the person and the Lord Jesus. And as they follow him, Holy Spirit will bring sanctification, which means a changing of how we think and how we act, just like every single one of us. And uh, by the way, I've made myself a note. See that, Rod? By the way, by the, way. <laughs> the women never got the chance to anoint Jesus after his death, because when they came to the tomb to do that, he had already risen from the dead. I wonder at that moment what Mary must have felt and all of a sudden, when she realized that this offering that she had given, this anointing that she did, and what Jesus had said, all of a sudden made sense. All of a sudden, another light came on. What a beautiful thing for Mary to realize in her heart of hearts what she actually did. And that this, Jesus said, imagine assuredly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Fascinating. That's amazing. Of course, you can think about this and the, what, what did Mary, the mother of Jesus, think mm -hmm. after the resurrection? I mean, oh my goodness, this is absolutely stunning. Very good. Well, let's pray. 